Well, hello again. Here we are in the office. Can't go out. Although I've spent the evening um, in the garden getting my hands filthy and torn to shreds. Perhaps it's a good job we're not actually playing golf. Right, the title of the video is correct. Today, I am 55 years old. Happy birthday, me. Yeah, I know, I look crap, don't I? You know, if I take the beard off, I look, oh, almost three or four days younger. So, yes, yeah, my birthday. Um, so, let's do the... Um, make a wish, and I expect your wish is exactly the same as mine. I'm going to enjoy this in a moment. Where the hell was I? Let me introduce myself properly. My name is Simon. I was born in Manchester. I was born at home in a house. I've got my reading glasses on. I was born at home in a house that overlooked the 18th hole of Stand Golf Club where my dad played. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, my beginning in golf. Now, I'm not going to convince you I was Rory McIlroy chipping into a washing machine because the washing machine was a top loader and uh, my mum would have gone spare. No, I was given a putter when I was about six or seven years old. Can't remember exactly when. It was a hickory shafted brass headed putter with a leather grip. It was full length, it wasn't cut down for me, so I think that's where I developed my elbows out kind of putting stroke and why I'm comfortable playing with a putter that is far too long for me, because I've always played with a putter that's far too long with me. For me, sorry. There was a four iron somewhere when I was about seven. It was a punch dot face it was steel shaft, but it had a plastic coating that was brown and had some sort of fake grain on it to make it look like hickory. I can only imagine it was something from the 50s. But that's where I started my first recollection of golf. And my dad pushed and pushed and pushed for, for me to play golf. Um... If there was a ball involved, my dad played it. Now, I want to talk about my dad today, but first I'm going to show you some photographs that I have got in my collection. So um, I'll be back in a minute. Now, um, being a dad is a strange thing because you work a lot, you work long hours, you don't tend to see your kids growing up, then your kids become teenagers and they rebel, then they get into their 20s and they're going out all the time and eventually they buy a house and perhaps they get married and have some kids of their own. And it's really only when you're getting much older that you get into contact with your kids again and they learn what makes you tick why you have been the way you have been for the last 30 35 years and that's certainly what happened to me i didn't really know my dad that well until he retired he he was in the nuclear industry and uh, Britain wound down its uh, nuclear building program. 
he was in nuclear waste containers. If any of you remember that um, set up accident that they had where they ran a train into a nuclear waste container to see if it would take uh, a big hit. Well, he was uh, second in command on that one. That's what my dad did for a living. I mean, obviously he started in coal fire power stations because there wasn't nuclear around, but uh, that's where he finished. And I didn't really get to know him until he retired. That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? My dad was f retired at 57 and I didn't really know him till I was 57, till he was 57. Good grief. Good grief, I'm only two years off 57. Where has the time gone? But I started to learn what made him tick. And you kind of like, you get to a certain age and you fall in love with your parents again. Because for so long you have been um, doing your own thing, building your own house and your own family, so to speak, your own home. I suppose some people build their own house, but we build our own home. Now in all that time, between him retiring and all the golf that we played together, nowhere was there ever a thought of going back to Manchester and going to play Stand Golf Club. Because we moved down south in 73 when I was eight. And um, I didn't have much choice. I, I would have much preferred to stay. <laughs> you know it is when you're a kid. You're going you're gonna to miss your friends. And then you come down south and you've got a weird accent. And everyone takes the piss out of you. Because you've got a weird, strange accent. But all the time between um, us playing a lot of golf together and him dying, it never crossed our minds to go back to Manchester. Now when he was uh, 68, sorry, 67, he started having trouble keeping food down and he started losing weight. And it took them an entire year, an entire year to eventually diagnose stomach cancer. And they operated and removed it and declared him fit and well and gave him a program for eating. Because when you don't have a stomach grumbling at you, you you've got to like force feed yourself, but you can't eat much, so you're forever eating small amounts. So that was sixty age sixty eight. Had his sixty ninth birthday, and a couple of months later, he was having trouble regurgitating again, and they said, "Oh, you've probably just got your plumbing." Uh, tangled up we'll, we'll open you up well of course it was it was inevitable he had bowel cancer and it was throughout his entire abdomen and they sent him home to die basically fortunately he uh, he went in two weeks and he slept most of it he didn't need morphine um, he died comfortably let's put it that way about three days before he died, he, he did wake up. My wife and I were sat on the end of the bed. And uh, the last thing that he said to me before going back to sleep was, you're right, Simon, if you want to do something with your life, you should go out and do it. See, since he retired, and he retired on a very good pension and a very large lump sum, I'd been encouraging mum and dad to go and do the things that they'd wanted to do. Now they did do about 10 or 20% of what they wanted to do, but there was so much that they didn't do. See, when you're a child of the 30s and you've had nothing and you've gone through the war and you've had nothing, then you go through rationing and you've got nothing. I mean, people don't understand what Poverty and having nothing is these days. Poverty is having a 48-inch TV instead of a 56-inch TV. That's what they consider poverty. But when you've had nothing, when you've lived through having nothing, then you're always afraid to go back to nothing. So I think it, there was a lot of fear involved in actually spending money and doing the things that they wanted to do. And uh, no matter how much I encouraged them, they never did some of the things that they wanted to do. 
I mean, my mum had a cousin in a cousin in New Zealand, and they were going to go down there for a month, and they just never got round to it. Now I find it very hard. I've I've got a photo of my dad, my birthday time April, so he died in the July, and he's um, tiny, because cancer eats you. It consumes you. He, he can't have been more than 70, 75 pounds. And that's a photo I can't look at. Uh, it's very, very difficult for me to see my dad looking like that. So the purpose of this part of the video is get to know your parents again, your siblings, all the things that you want to do together, do together. You never know when time is going to run out. If you've moved away from your hometown, pick your parents up. Take them back to their hometown for the day. They'll love it. They'll love going back to their hometown. The next point is, if there's something that you want to do for yourself, then do it. I've always had a fascination with the Far East, with the Far Eastern culture and traditions and uh, Buddhism and that sort of thing. Not that I'm a religious person, I'm just very, very curious about it all. And uh, so I went. I didn't actually get to everywhere. But uh, after my dad died, I said, that's it, I'm, I'm doing this. And I ended up going to Thailand and I played golf in Thailand. And I kind of like got stuck going to Thailand and I'll tell you why. Singapore is too expensive. Couldn't afford Singapore. Malaysia didn't um, quite appeal to me. I had a look at Taiwan for golf and there's plenty of golf in Taiwan. But again, it's too expensive. Cambodia is certainly on the radar. May actually get there one day. Oh, excuse me. Vietnam, no. Because you're kind of like stuck on a golf resort. I've been invited to Indonesia. But the weather there is pretty miserable humid all the year round whereas Thailand seems to get get the little bit better plus it's only one flight it's 11 and a half hours from London to Bangkok it's a bit longer coming home uh, into the wind but it's 11 and a half hours it's a direct flight I'm not going to lose my gear halfway and it's affordable so I keep going back there because I've made so many friends from all around the world and we kind of like exchange emails and it's when are you going back when are you going back when it and we all meet up and we, we have a laugh we play golf and we have a few few bevies love to go to Japan but again it's unaffordable like follow your dreams but there has to be a financial um, constraint of some sort now every time I go there's always a group of guys who say, oh yeah, I really want to go, I really want to go, really want to go, really want to go. How much does it cost? So I give them a breakdown of what it costs. So two weeks in Thailand, the flight is, uh, economy is 500 quid. Bed and breakfast in a really good, secure, safe, clean hotel is 50 quid a night. The golf varies from £60 a round up to about £110 a round. Food and drink, you know, 50 quid a day will cover it. Once you, once you start adding up the figures, you can basically have two weeks in Thailand in a really nice hotel, eight rounds of golf on golf courses of a standard you will not believe for maybe three grand, 3200 something like that. It's not a lot of money. In the grand scheme of things, 3,200 quid is not a lot of money. And they'll say, oh, oh, I can't save up for that. And I say, well, how much do you spend on beer every week? Oh, about 100 quid. 
So uh, you spend 5,200 quid a year on beer and you can't afford to quit beer for 12 months and go to Thailand. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't quit beer. Well, in that case, you don't really want to go. Because if you really want to do something, you will find a way of doing it. So, happy birthday, me. Actually, I share a birthday with Sevi. You'll hear on some of the videos, the guys call me Sevi. It's because we have the same birthday, 9th of April. Same as Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the great engineer. Probably the best engineer that uh, England has produced. And of course, Hugh Hefner. I'm not too sure what he did for a living. I think he must have been a journalist because he sold a magazine or two, didn't he? So, do the things that you're supposed to be doing with your family. Don't keep putting it off. You never know when the sand is going to run out of the glass. So do it. If there's something you want to do, do it. And when this mess that we're in at the moment is over, then we're all going to realise just how good life is and that we shouldn't waste a minute of it watching YouTube. <laughs> no, no, keep watching YouTube. Don't watch the telly. There's sod all on the telly. Anyway, what do you think of the shirt? Got this from Eastern Star two years ago. I saw it on the rack and it just called my name. This is this is me. I got this from my uh, maternal grandfather. He, he loved colour. And if you go to the Far East, all you will see everywhere is colour. This is plain compared to some of the stuff you see, in, uh, see out there. Well then, bye for now. There's still a few videos to go. So uh, there's still something to watch. I haven't resorted to making garden videos yet, but um, it's not far off. Goodness knows what I'm going to do out there. One good bit of news. I found a tin of fence paint in the shed and I thought, oh God, I'm going to be painting fences. Fortunately, there's only a little dribble left in the bottom, so I'm not going to be painting anything. I got out that one. See you soon. Ta-ra.